Okay. All right. So uh, go ahead and take some notes for this. Uh, this. You can call this lecture in your notes the New South. This is the New South right now. And uh, one of the things that's, uh, and I don't know how long this lecture should take me. It probably take me about 40 minutes or so. The thing is, is that once uh, the South is defeated, even, even during Reconstruction, they have to ask themselves the question about why we lost and how we lost and uh, what was the purpose. Because ultimately, the Southerners, and this is going to get the, to the coming of uh, Jim Crow in a sense, it's going to be the New South, and it also gets to a larger issue of reconciliation between the two uh, parts of the nation. How do Southerners explain they, how they lost the war? Now, most Southerners understand that they lost the war. There will always be some bitter enders who uh, do not understand that, and I think I make reference to it in that Texas lecture uh, that can be used for 1302 and can be used for Texas History 2301. Uh, there will be bitter enders who never understood that the South lost the Civil War, and they will hang around Texas in the process. But when it comes to the, those who do understand it, that does not mean that they want to just simply throw their hands up and beg and plead mercy upon Northerners and the good graces of the Northerners. So what I want you to put in your notes is uh, not only this is the New South, but you can also call this the Lost Cause. Um, the Lost Cause, if you've uh, been paying attention to, the, uh, to politics and you've been paying attention to the news in the last three or four months, especially uh, since the COVID got going, and uh, especially during the summer, when if you've noticed there were some statues that were pulled down here and there, statues of Robert E. Lee, statues of Stonewall Jackson, statues of Albert Pike, statues of people you would not have thought would have been pulled down but were uh, as well. Even, uh, say, the Thomas Jeffersons of the world, uh, they, got a, they got dinged up pretty good uh, in the summer. But especially those uh, statues of men uh, and a few women, but mostly all men who had fought or had been leaders in the Civil War, uh, those statues got pulled down. And if you were paying close attention to the words, uh, there's going to be a whole lot of discussion um, about uh, what happened and what caused, uh, you know, why are those statues there and what do we do about them? And a lot of those statues are going to be erected after the Civil War in about the years. You can put this in your notes. I, I would know this. Uh, it's, it's kind of important. Uh, from about the year, say, 1875 to about 1920, from 1875 to about 1920, you will see a lot of individuals, a lot of individuals who are uh, going to be immortalized and a lot of individuals who will spend time and money erecting these statues and various and sundry other memorials throughout southern towns and cities. Uh, to answer the question, to kind of help foster the, what's called, called the lost cause, the lost cause myth sometimes. Uh, and so this is going to be take the form of physical uh, remembrances. It's also going to take the form of how do we teach the Civil War. So really, in a sense, what I'm going to say for a few minutes today is, is going to talk about this lost cause. The uh, Southerners are going to try to explain the Civil War as a, a forlorn, and hence the name lost cause, a forlorn, hopeless, yet uh, dramatic uh, effort to maintain their way of life. And I think you can put it kind of like that in your notes. Why did the Southerners fight the Civil War? The lost cause is not going to say, well, we fought the Civil War for the slaves or to maintain slavery. That's the first thing you need to keep in mind. They're not going to answer the question of why do we fight the Civil War with, well, we fought it to preserve slavery. They push that aside. They sit that aside and they say, well, that's, that's not our re logic and reasoning. Uh, quite honestly, you can put it in your notes like this. Uh, what the answer is going to be in the post-Civil War era is that we fought the Civil War for uh, states' rights. We fought the Civil War for uh, our liberties. And then when they, talk about, uh, when they talk about liberties and such like that, they're not talking about uh, slavery. They're talking about states' rights, local control, and so on. Uh, that's one of the things that they're, they're going to talk about as far as the war itself. Secondly, they also have to ask and answer the question, how do we lose the war? So the next thing in your notes is, how does the South lose the war? The answer isn't so much that they were conquered 
uh, because of some questionable military actions on the battlefield, especially in the West. They're going to answer uh, the question of how do we lose the Civil War? We lost the Civil War because the North was such a superior opponent in the form of men and material that the North just overwhelmed the South and just overran the South, and it was, uh, in that sense, a lost cause. To say it a little differently, and this is an important concept because uh, Northerners will swallow this too to some degree, is they will swallow and say, uh, yeah, that's kind of right. Yeah, especially by 1885 or so, 20 years after the war is over, they'll say that, yeah, uh, the Southerners, uh, they fought uh, valiantly. The Southerners, uh, they fought as an agricultural people, uh, a chivalrous people, uh, uh, an antique people, if you like, and they were overrun by the great behemoth that is the northern industry. Uh, economically speaking, the north could pump out thousands and thousands and thousands of shoes, in fact, millions of shoes, millions of guns, millions of this, thousands of that. All those supplies of war could be pumped out and ultimately would, uh, would win, win the war, and the South really had no chance to win. Uh, there's a fellow I enjoy reading, actually. Put this man's name in your notes. He's really one of the great uh, uh, writers of the Civil War. I think his history is ultimately still very good. His name is Shelby Foote, F-O-O-T-E, Shelby Foote. Shelby Foote was a, is a Mississippi, and he's now dead, been dead about 15, 20 years at this point. But he wrote probably the single best uh, readable account of the Civil War uh, in our history, in, in our national history. And uh, even uh, and Shelby Foote, I think, was right on most things. Uh, but his, uh, his comment was once, he said, when asked, well, why did the South lose? And he said, basically, the North. I mean, the North had uh, just had so much. And he said, well, and he was later asked, uh, could the South have won the Civil War? And this is really the crux of the matter, is, is that could the South have won the Civil War? And Foote's answer, like many others is, especially in that lost cause mythology, was is that no, they couldn't have. That in Foote's terminology, they all they had to do was pull, meaning the North, all the North had to do was pull its other arm around from its back and then club the South and win. I don't think that's exactly right. The North clearly had a manpower advantage and they clearly had an economic advantage that uh, we can't just brush off and, you know, hand wave away and say, oh, that's not true. Cause, but the South had opportunities at times, uh, at Gettysburg arguably, uh, at Antietam as well, and even in 1864 there seemed to be some opportunities for the South to have won the war, but they didn't. Uh, there was uh, losses on the battlefields uh, in both the West and in the East, especially out West, uh, that ultimately dooms the Confederacy. But also, uh, not only is the South going to argue that they lost the Civil War not just because of, uh, or rather they lost the Civil War because of the material, and they didn't just fight the Civil War just because, uh, they didn't fight the Civil War for slavery, but they're going to talk about slavery, put this in your notes as well, they're going to talk about slavery as a benign institution. They're going to talk about slavery as a good institution, that ultimately when you say slavery and you talk about what was uh, going on uh, on the, the plantation or on the farm, uh, the answer is going to be that they, those slaves were in fact very happy to be slaves. And, uh, but that's going to be refuted, frankly, uh, by what you saw during the war. What, what you saw was is that it was like the happy slave answer. Uh, it was the happy slave, the contented slave, uh, that they were uh, ultimately really uh, quite uh, excited about, or I say excited, maybe a bit stretched, but certainly they were happy to be on the plantation and to be owned because they were taken care of. That was the, the lost cause answer. Uh, the reality is quite different. If that was actually true, you would have seen many, many thousands, or at least hundreds, but certainly probably thousands of uh, slaves flock to the proverbial banner of the Confederacy and have joined the Confederate Army in some way or another beyond being compelled to be rear echelon baggage carriers. But what you saw in the Civil War actually was you saw probably between 100, and, I've seen anywhere from 100 to 180,000, so it's a good number. But uh, say about, a, let's just round it off and just give you a number for your notes, but let's just say 150,000. 150,000 uh, slaves, uh, either runaway slaves, or when I say runaway, that could have been they ran to the north, or literally as the uh, Union Army got close to their plantation, they ran to that army and then joined it. Uh, you will see somewhere in the neighborhood of 150,000 slaves 
join the Union Army either in combat arms or they will be rear echelon uh, logistical support uh, for the Union Army. And, and they, the slaves, during the war, vote with their feet. Had they been contented, uh, you probably wouldn't have seen those sorts of numbers, but that's just simply not the case. Um, also, you'll see this also put in your notes too. Not only is the slave was contented, but slavery was a benign institution, in fact, a, a loving institution. Uh, that would be something else to keep in mind too. That in the sense that after the Civil War, the argument becomes from the South is, is that a slave was treated better, put this in your notes, would be treated better uh, than, say, a wage earner in the North. And in some, in a few instances, I can think of that, yes, that might actually be true in some of the heavy, heavy industries or in some of those coal mines of Pennsylvania or even Tredegar over there at Richmond, Virginia. But to say that the uh, slave, the, uh, being a slave on a plantation was in the main, in the, in the majority, better for the uh, uh, slave than it was uh, to be a wage earner up north, that's just simply not going to hold water. If you were a man and you were, looked, lived on those plantations, uh, or even not even a plantation, but you lived on the farms that were, you were with your owner, uh, you could be rented, uh, you could be loaned out, uh, you could be, of course, sold. If you had family members uh, or a wife, uh, the fact of the matter was is that your wife uh, may not even live with you. She may be separated by distance, or you may be sold, or her, your family may be sold, and there was that, that obvious uh, busting up of the family let alone the fact there's whippings, beatings, and so on. So the uh, uh, slavery as a benign institution was really in many respects an invention of the South after the Civil War, and answering the question in that sense there. So uh, you have a whole a lot of things that's going to go into it. Next up in this issue of uh, the answer of why and how we lost the Civil War, please put this in your notes. There's a religious angle as well. A very much a religious angle that's going to come out of this. And the religious angle comes at it uh, in such a way, first of all, prior to the Civil War uh, in the 1850s, you will see Southern clergymen, you will see Southerners ask and uh, state that God was clearly on the side of the Southerners, that the Southern way of life was in fact really the more Christian, and this is all going to be a, from a Christian perspective, a more Christian way of life and a more Christian uh, organization than when you found up north. Uh, they may not quite go so far, though some would, go so far as to say the godless northerner or the godless Yankee, uh, but certainly there was a, a chauvinism and a superiority uh, pre preached and taught that the southern way of life, including the economics of slavery and all the, and the agriculture that goes with it, it in fact was a superior way of life than what you found elsewhere. So uh, in, up north. In addition to that, after the Civil War is over, or during the war, Civil War, excuse me, during the Civil War, you will see North, Southern preachers and Southern politicians invoke the aid of God and basically say again and again that God won't let us lose. God will keep us and, and God will protect our men and God will win. He's fighting for us. He's fighting with us. You need to know that. You need to say that in your notes. That, God, that there is a not just that uh, we pray for uh, God's protection, but God is actively fighting on our in our favor against our enemies. And uh, say after the Battle of Fredericksburg, which is in Virginia, in December of 1862, which was a big Confederate victory. I mean, a gigantic Confederate victory. Uh, the uh, for example, the Northern Lights uh, danced uh, on the battlefield over the battlefield. I mean, it was the Confederate, basically in Virginia, you don't see the Northern Lights, but yet there they were, there right after the, the night of the Battle of Fredericksburg, and you saw Confederates mar remark in letters home and elsewhere basically saying, oh, by the way, God is really celebrating a Confederate victory. But then you lose the war, and then you lose the war, and then the question has to be asked, who got what wrong? You know, if you're saying for an extended period of time that God is on your side, he's actively fighting them for you, then, and then you lose the war. So what happened? How did you, how did you get it wrong? And so the answer, put this in your notes, comes back, as uh, that God had a greater vision and a greater desire for the Southerner to remain in the Union, and that the Southerners, the Southern way of life, of course, was fine, and that... Uh, 
but the South needed to remain in the Union to act as a good and godly or a good and Christian example for those Northerners who are wage slaves and so on and so on. Uh, you have to, if you're going to invoke the aid of God, and you, and you clearly are saying and telling people God's on our side, yet you lose and, and, and you're wrecked, because that's true for the South, especially Virginia, Tennessee, and some other deep South states, you've got to be able to say, what happened? Preacher or politician, you said God was on our side, yet where was he? And what was he doing? Well, the answer isn't that we were wrong. The answer is, is that God had other plans for us, and he in intended for us to do this, that, and the other. But he wanted us to be in the union. So you have those in there. Last but not least, and this is big now, uh, in some respects this is going to get me back to those monuments that I talked about just a moment ago, is, uh, you know, how do you maintain your heritage? How do you maintain these uh, mile markers, these uh, signposts of your heritage, of, of your history, as it were, especially the history of the South prior to the Civil War and of the Civil War? One of the ways you do it is you're going to build monuments. There's no two ways about it. You're going to build monuments. So please uh, make note of that. You're going to build monuments. You're going to do a lot of things, but this is one. Uh, the first big one that came up in, uh, in Virginia, and uh, it's gone, I think they've torn it down completely now. If they have it, they're taking it down as they go. But uh, in Richmond, Virginia, which was the capital of the Confederacy, uh, in Richmond, Virginia, there is a, uh, it, it's really in downtown close to the Capitol, uh, the old Capitol building, where you see all these monuments to Southerners as they, uh, as they were. And the first one that got put up was uh, to Stonewall Jackson. Of the three men, and there's, there's more than just that, but of the three men who are going to be the centerpieces of this lost cause mythology, especially about the, uh, the sainted, and I use a, a loaded religious term now, but of the sainted southerner or the sainted leader is going to be uh, one of which is going to be Stonewall Jackson. Some of you know who Stonewall Jackson is. Some of you may not. Stonewall Jackson was uh, killed during the war. He was an excellent, excellent uh, general. Uh, probably not quite as great as sometimes he has been claimed to have been, but at the same time, he was certainly not mediocre. He was far above that. Uh, he was also very pious. Uh, he was a, a fire-breathing uh, uh, Presbyterian, and at times he resembled more Oliver Cromwell than he did uh, a, a meek and mild uh, individual. All of which is to say is Stonewall Jackson, in his greatest moment of victory, he gets shot down very dramatically, actually, and he's not shot by the Yankees, but he's shot during the nighttime by his own men who were nervous uh, after the Battle of Chancellorsville. You can read all the details, but that's it in a nutshell. So Jackson gets uh, shot, and he dies about a week later from pneumonia, and ultimately he's gone. And so some would say, Lee himself said, uh, Jackson has lost his left arm, but I've lost my right. It was felt a great and heavy blow upon the Confederacy. But after the war was over in 18, I believe it was 75, it may have been 77, but it's right at the end of Reconstruction that we've talked about, there's going to be the unveiling of that Stonewall Jackson statue, and he's on the back of a horse in, in Richmond. Put this in your notes now, especially. You're going to get the idea of how much of a religious overtone there is. In, uh, eight, it, at the Jackson statue, the person who's going to unveil the statue is that of the girl, Stonewall Jackson's daughter, who at this point in time is about a 18, 17 or so year old girl. She pulls the, the, the uh, curtain away, as it were. It pulls the, the, the cover away. But when she walked up to do that thing, there were old Confederates. There were ex-soldiers who were around the statue. And when she walked up, uh, it wasn't just a no normal Southern courtesy of removing your cap, but the way they removed it and they kind of tipped themselves as such, they were, in a sense, bowing to the daughter of a great and good man, a saintly man, uh, in this case, certainly a secular saint, and uh, the great Stonewall Jackson's daughter. And so you see these, these uh, mementos get going. 1890, use that year in your notes now, 1890. A similar sort of scene now in Richmond, Virginia. This time, 100,000 people, uh, it's the biggest crowd in 30 years in Richmond, but 100,000 people turn out in 1890 to see the unveiling of the Robert E. Lee statue. And so Lee upon his horse, Lee looking into the distance, Lee looking uh, and giving a, a definite, uh, just kind of a distant stare, but Lee the marble man. I want you to use that expression in your notes, the marble man. 
The Marble Man, uh, I've used that, if you've had me for other classes, I've used that in 01, 1301. I'll use that in other places from time to time. And you have marble men uh, in, in, our his, in our culture to this day, I would argue. Uh, what is a marble man? He is a perfect historical figure. Uh, you paper over and you ignore his faults or shortcomings or just simply his humanity. And you create like a marble statue, say David, uh, the statue of David in, uh, is it, oh, is it in Rome? I believe it's in Rome. Uh, you may correct me or whatever, but or maybe it's in Paris in one of those, in the Louvre or something like that. But wherever the statue of David is, uh, you see David and he does not have, he doesn't have flabbiness or anything like that. He doesn't have jowls. Uh, he's not uh, a fat or anything of that nature. Other marble statues, you can see it. Those men are cold, uh, piercing, perfect, and so on. That's the idea of the marble man. And in our history, George Washington at times and most of the time has been a marble man. Abraham Lincoln would be another example of a marble man in many cases. And I would say in more, far more modern times uh, recently, it, uh, and I think this is still true basically, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is a bit of a marble man. What I'm saying is, is that good o overall, uh, or at least certainly uh, memorable, and I think good for those men I just uh, uh, ticked off to you, but the fact is, is that they are... Uh, idolized to the point of immortality uh, and simply infallibility, to use some uh, theological terms. And the same was done for Robert E. Lee. And so the second of those two, three men who play the role of the saint of the Confederacy, the saints, uh, the great man of the Confederacy, and really probably the greatest of the men, is Robert E. Lee. Yeah, I think you need to write that down. Uh, you will see Robert E. Lee statues throughout the South. Uh, here recently in the last few months in Dallas, I take the Dallas Morning News, the statue of Robert E. Lee came down over there, or at least was boxed up and uh, hidden from view and so forth. Anyways, uh, but in Virginia, and that one was put up in about 1910, I think, in Dallas. But the one in Virginia is in 1890. And, but of all the characters that are out there, Robert E. Lee is uh, idolized as the man who most identifies and most emulates and is most the example of the perfect Southern man, the perfect Southern gentleman. And that's, that's a big thing right there. So what's the perfect Southern gentleman like? First of all, he is uh, true to his people. He's true to his state. In the case of Lee, he was true to Virginia. He fought to defend his state and his people from the inv invading hordes of the Yankees. Depends on how you're, who you're talking to, depends on how they say it, but basically he defends his hearth and home. He fought for the best of reasons. He was magnanimous to his uh, enemies in defeat. He was magnanimous and good in... in um, in a defeat, whether he defeated the uh, Yankees at times or in the ultimate defeat at Appomattox, yet he was always the perfect and good gentleman. He was always the good Christian uh, in his actions and so forth. And he, after the war is over, he, Lee, is trying to promote a reconciliation and a bringing together of the nation which was desperately wanted in, around the turn of the 20th century. That's uh, something I'll bring back in a second. But Lee is this not only just this good public figure, but also put this in your notes, he's also a good private figure. He is uh, true to his wife. He's a, a good father. Uh, he just plays the role of this good and great man. And, and remember this when I use the term good and great. Those are two different things. Good is not the same as great. Good is a moral term. And great is more of a historical term, I would argue. But certainly, he is the good and great man of this event. And he is uh, going to be uh, lionized and turned into the marble man. Um, to the point, let's say it like this. If you were a man, uh, even if you didn't fight in the Civil War, say you were the too young to have fought in the Civil War. After the war is over, after the war is over, you would take uh, your son by the hand. Let's say make this the year 1900 just for a round year. The, the, lost cause, uh, the, the lost cause is still going strong. You would take, as it were, you would take your child by the hand. If you saw, if you're really wanting to make a point for that child of yours to, you know, what you should do when you grow up, you would take them by the hand almost literally and say, oh, by the way, let me tell you, who do you want to emulate? That's the person you want to be like. Uh, if it was a boy, you would take him by the hand and say, son, you could choose no better uh, person outside of perhaps Jesus himself or George Washington. And I'm not being facetious here. I'm being serious as a heart attack. There was no greater man. You could say to a southern boy and say, that is the epitome of a man right there. Emulate him. 
be like him, and you will go far. Uh, and that's true for Southerners especially, but I'd even say this in your notes is just a little note off to the side, is, is that even some Northerners will go that route too. And I'll talk about that in a later lecture, uh, probably in about a week, but at the same time, you, maybe two or three now. Uh, but the short of the story is, is that you will see even up north, there will be people saying, you know what, Robert E. Lee, he was a great man, and he did, uh, he did a lot with a little meaning he, he, fought, he fought as long as he could against the behemoth north. And you can see this in the south. For a girl, so like me, I've got my daughter Caroline. What I would do if I was, uh, say, around the year 1900, and I was uh, trying to impress my daughter upon a point here, what I would say to her is I said, uh, Caroline, uh, if you could marry a man like who had the same qualities and the same virtues as Robert E. Lee, you would be marrying a great man. And so there's a, uh, there is a, a the, the word cult is thrown around way too much right now, but there is certainly an aura that it surrounds Lee. Um, I can speak for my own family, my grandmother, and this may sound strange what I'm about to say to you, but my, my you understand this about Giesenschlags is, is that Giesenschlags, we always get married late in life. Some of y'all are going to probably going to say the same thing in your family. Get married at age 20, excuse me, get married at age 40, have a couple of kids at age 50. You can string a generation out that way. My grandmother on my dad's side was born in 1905. She comes, she is as English as they come. Uh, they, her family moved from Alabama after the Civil War was over, moved to Texas because Alabama had been wrecked by the war. So that's what brought them here. Anyways, uh, even, and she was born in 1905, and so she grew up at the tail end of this lost cause stuff. It was just a basic understood fact that if you said the word or the name Robert E. Lee to her, it was one of those, you know, there was, comes a hush over the voice. It was not, a, it was a, a whispered, the great General Lee, you know, just kind of a, hmm. You, 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 the awe is the word I'm looking for, the awe in the voice. My grandmother had that. I never heard it. She died in 1985 when I was a boy. Uh, but dad, my father, we, my father's a historian as well, so I guess the apple did not fall far from the tree. But he, we were talking about this one time, and we were talking about Lee, and he said, yeah, she thought a lot of him. And whenever, basically whenever you said Lee's name, uh, her voice dropped to a, not a whisper, but certainly an awe uh, sort of thing. And that her family, uh, they'd fought in the Civil War in the Confederate Army as well, um, several sides in, in her case. Well, I'm going with this also, so Lee's a big figure, and there's number three. Here's number three for you. So we've got Stonewall Jackson, who I've spent a little time on, Lee a lot of time on, uh, as far as the great monuments. And this last one, you're not going to see him so much in the south, uh, excuse me, in this part of the south, meaning Texas. You will see you will see this third man in, say, Tennessee especially, but other the upper south, which is like Tennessee and uh, North Carolina, uh, certainly Virginia. This third one is a fellow named Sam Davis. Sam Davis. Sam Davis is a, a young man. He's a man, but he's still, he's youngish. He's not old. Uh, he's 21 when he dies in the war. But what happens to Sam Davis is that he is caught as a spy, and he had a chance to save his life. Had he uh, ratted out his uh, fellow spies, had he uh, reneged on his promises or what have you, the thing was is that he would have, Davis would have saved his life. And so what ends up happening is, is that Davis refuses to do so. Davis says to uh, his Yankee captors, he says, I would rather die a thousand deaths than betray a friend. That's a dramatic statement. And if you think about it, you know your American history a little bit, that is in the same vein as another individual who himself was a failed spy, was captured and eventually executed. That man's name is Nathan Hale, who himself said at the, in a disastrous moment in American military history in 1776, Hale was captured and he was uh, basically asked, do you have any last words? And he says, I uh, regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. So it's the same vein. That's Hale. Sam Davis says, I would rather die a thousand deaths than betray a friend. And oh, that's dramatic. Oh, that's, uh, that's good stuff right there. And so if you're teaching the boys, if you're teaching the kids, and this lost cause uh, aura and mystique is going to be taught in the schools, if you want to perpetuate stuff, you need to teach it. You can't just build a few monuments. 
the the you know, there will be monuments to Sam Davis, but they will teach as him as the boy, boy martyr of the Confederacy. That's his kind of title, the boy martyr of the Confeder- Confederacy. What did he do? He he laid down his life for the cause. He tried to defend his save his friends and so on. Um, and you will see this taught in the schools throughout the South. You will see monuments erected, put this in your notes, not just in the big cities. I mean, in the state of Texas, at the Capitol grounds there in Austin, there, if you've been on the grounds of the Capitol of Austin, there is a monument uh, to the Confederacy there uh, on the grounds. In the Senate chamber, I'd like to say, there is a, a big uh, picture of Jefferson Davis, the president. Uh, those, some of those things on the Capitol grounds in Austin are certainly, and maybe all of them, I'd have to look at the exact dates. You can, that's the really easy tell. But a lot of those ex-Confederates that are showing, that are on the grounds of the Capitol in Texas, they were uh, put there during this Lost Cause Remembrance Territory. Next up, also put this in your notes too, is in in small towns, you will see uh, monuments erected. Normally, it's not going to be to Robert E. Lee. Sometimes it is. But if it's not to Lee, it's going to be to the common soldier, the boys from uh, Company H who gave their lives at the Battle of Shiloh or whatever the express, wherever the place was. The common soldier would be memorialized, and on and on we can go. This is, uh, has profound impact upon the South, and it is, uh, in fact, you could say, lastly in your notes this way, the lost cause in the war itself will consume some Southerners as far as what do they obs- uh, obsess over and what do they talk about years after the war is over. Even as late as the 1880s, say 1885, 1890, obviously that Lee statue I gave the example, Southerners will be talking about the war, whereas Northerners had not necessarily forgot the war, but they had certainly moved on. But one last thing to say before I talk about what's really called the New South is is that the North was, this is worth remembering now, and it's kind of a, it's a big deal uh, in the sense that the North is kind of complicit in this uh, lost cause mythology. I'll go more into it later, but I, I do want to say they are complicit in that it was, it is true that both the South and the North, after the war was over, especially as you're headed toward the 20th century, are looking for ways to reconcile the nation, bring it together, bring it together. And so... One of the ways the North can reconcile the situation is this. They can say, and they can admit, and they do it in various ways, such as uh, calling uh, ex-Confederate rebels um, uh, veterans, allowing, giving back battle flags, and so forth. They will uh, simply say the Southern soldier was a valorous soldier. They will go out of their way, Northerners, especially political types, but Northerners uh, will generally say to bring the nation together, we have to make the Southerners feel welcome back into the Union. And as you were heading toward the 20th century, especially after the old abolitionists are dead, you start to see this national desire to reunify the nation and reconciliation come about. Uh, And and maybe the best graphic example I can think of, anecdotal example, takes place at the end of this Lost Cause stuff, is in 1924. Uh, That's a good good year. I don't know that I'll actually use the year, but in 1924, the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial was established. Uh, The dedication of the Lincoln Memorial was uh, put uh, open to the public in Washington, D.C. Many of you who've been to D.C., pretty much everybody who goes to D.C. as a tourist goes by the Lincoln Memorial and sees Lincoln sitting there on those law books. You would think, and I would think, I would have thought this, but you would think that uh, the honored guest at the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial would have been Union soldiers who fought under Lincoln's presidency and freedmen, former slaves or their descendants who were freed by Lincoln would have been there. Those would have been the two ones. But it, even as late as 1924, there was still this desire amongst the, in the nation to continue the, the healing of the nation after the Civil War was over, the reconciliation and bringing the nation together. And so the honored guests there at Lincoln's memorial weren't uh, freedmen or their descendants, uh, but the honored guests were Union soldiers and con- ex-Confederate soldiers. You can, well, this ultimately, my point is keeping, I keep doing this, is reconcile the nation. And so that's why you built those things. It's, it's, it's uh, partial to explain how we lost the war from the Southern perspective 
and also we need to get the nation back together. The New South, however, is uh, something we need to spend just a moment of your time on, and then I'll cut, I think I'll cut you loose or take questions, or I might even just have a review session with you and just uh, get you ready for the exam. So uh, here's the, uh, the last part of today's lecture. Not everybody in the South were laying awake at night worrying about uh, the, ex the uh, Confederacy. Not everybody in the South after the war was over saying, my gosh, we have got to keep going on. We have to keep talking about the Confederacy. Uh, they weren't like Jubal Early, who was a, a prime uh, example of the Confederacy. Or, excuse me, a prime example of this lost cause stuff. This new South uh, was promoted by especially young Virginians. Young Virginians. Even before the Civil War, some young Virginians, and uh, these young Virginians would have been, say, in their 20s before the Civil War, fought in the war after the war, now in their 30s and 40s. But before the war, they looked at Virginia, put this in your notes, and they saw Virginia becoming back, a backwater. A backwater. At the founding of the United States, it's worth remembering that some of your most prominent individuals in the United States first the half a dozen presidents basically are Virginians Washington Jefferson Madison Monroe easy ones right there with the exception of Adams all of those were Virginians Virginia was the most populous state at the out at the founding of the nation Virginia was a very wealthy state at the founding of the nation but by the time the 1850s roll around you have had actually lots of Virginians move away and move westward and elsewhere Virginia was considered a backwater in some circles. It was considered uh, ignorant and lazy and on, these, on and on I could go. But these new Southerners, they wanted to do it differently. How do they do it differently? Well, number one, they're going to suggest we need to start building railroads. Move away from the canal. Build railroads. Do what you need to do. Let's see here. I thought I just heard somebody hit, a, uh, hit their microphone and go live. Who's saying you got a question? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to ask about. Uh... All right. So the New South uh, in the Virginia mindset is going to say we need to build more railroads. That's a big one right there. Build railroads. That is going to be a mania. It, it transcends party, FYI. It, it transcends Republican and Democrat. In the second half of the 19th century, before the war and especially after the war, you're going to see north and south, uh, east and west, you're going to see this mania that the crying need of the country is we need to build railroads. How are we going to make money? Build railroads. What do we need to survive? Build railroads. What do we need to do to thrive? Build railroads. How do I cur uh, cure male pattern baldness? Uh, build a railroad. And so the fact is, it, it, it's, it, I don't know what would, you, would be comparable today. I think I likened it to perhaps uh, uh, stadiums or something of that nature. Uh, but the thing is, is that uh, the idea of how do we uh, get, uh, get ahead, what's progress? Well, one, the big one is build a railroad. What's also progress to these new South boys? It's moving away from uh, cotton. It's moving away from agriculture. So how do you do that? You build more schools and universities, and more particularly, you build more industry. There's going to be an emphasis, we need more industry, heavy industry. We want to be like the North, which is a loaded statement because there are a lot of Southerners who say, hell no, hell no, we're not going to be like those Northerners uh, because of the war and everything we've just gone through. But there are a lot of new so Southerners, 30-year-olds and especially 40-year-olds, These this uh, upcoming generation now in, in charge in some respects, say in Virginia especially, are saying, we need to emulate the North. We need to emulate and be like them. Yes, they beat us, and yes, we revere tradition and history and the past, but we cannot just live in the past. Uh, frankly, if you're, uh, you, you may have seen this in your own family, your own community, the great push back and forth between the older generation and the younger generation. What does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to be this, that, or the other? Um, in fact, actually, if you've ever heard this, this I think this phrase has pretty much fallen out of uh, style nowadays, but if you've ever heard the expression an old fogey, so-and-so is an old fogey, that is actually a term used by young Virginians against older Virginians. Those old fogies are just holding us back. Those old fogies are just living in the past. On and on we can go. Uh, so it takes other forms too. This New South, some other things to consider, not just uh, heavy industry. Uh, by the way, put this name in your notes. I almost forgot this town. An example of heavy industry, uh, two examples would be Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham, Alabama. 
Birmingham, Alabama, if you've ever been there, uh, is not a pretty city. I mean, quite, <laughs> that sounds harsh. I mean, some of you are laughing perhaps at what I'm saying. But, I mean, it really isn't. I mean, come on. You, you can't say that Birmingham, Alabama is going to be accused of being a beautiful city. It's not. Um, the reason I bring them up is that Birmingham really got off the ground and blew up as the major city in the state of Alabama after the Civil War. One of the suburbs of um, uh, one of the suburbs of Birmingham is a town called Bessemer. Let me type that one up right quick. I'll put that in the, the chat bar. Bessemer. Bessemer is a an allusion to the or it's named for the process, the Bessemer process of steel making. If you look at Birmingham, the reason it looked so industrial was because it was a steel town. It was not the same size or volume as Pittsburgh, but there was a good deal of steel produced in, in Bessemer and in Birmingham. It was a lot of heavy industry, so it's kind of a dirty, grungy city. Uh, years gone by, Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is like Hipsterville now. Evidently, I think everybody who's hip goes to Chattanooga. I've, I've got My wife's got people up that way. But Chattanooga, 55, 70 years ago, was a dirty, grungy city as well. It was a railroad town. But the other one in Tennessee that's just right down the road from, um, from uh, Chattanooga that I would remember as well, another heavy industry sort of town, the name gives it away, uh, it's South Pittsburgh, South Pittsburgh, Ten Tennessee. South Pittsburgh. If you like to cook, and I imagine most of you have uh, cooked some, but some of you probably love to cook, and if you do and you have a cast iron skillet, odds are it's probably what's called a Lodge, Lodge brand cast iron skillet. That Lodge brand cast iron skillet is from South Pittsburgh, Tennessee, and that is heavy industry of the first order. I mean, that, that you can't get any more heavy than cast iron. Anyways, that's an example of the new South. We need to get new industry. Here's some more for your notes. Textiles. How else can we... Uh, get text uh, get uh, ahead in the south we need to bring the, the textiles into the south so what we mean by that is we're going to uh, want to make shirts and garments in the south you see it around uh, parts of alabama a lot of women move off the farm and move to these towns to work these textiles and work these looms uh, by the way if they, in a sense, if you've ever heard someone complain about so-and-so from a foreign nation is stealing American jobs because they're cheap workers, yada, yada, the thing is, is that that's been said a lot. British said it about Americans in the early 19th century. Those damn cheap Americans are stealing good British uh, jobs from us. And in the aftermath of the Civil War going toward the year uh, 1900, Northerners would said those damn cheap Southerners are stealing good Northern jobs. So the textile industry takes off in places like Birmingham. Another place, uh, other things uh, in the South, lots and lots of lumber. If you've ever driven through the South, even to this day, a lot of lumber is harvested out of the South. That's moving away from cotton and, and so forth. And last but not least, uh, tobacco. I mean, you can talk about oil, but I'll, that's really more of a Texas thing in my opinion. But if you want to talk about the South, uh, uh, new to uh, tobacco. And it's not, not old tobacco, but new types of tobacco. The one is called bright leaf. And let me put that into the chat bar right quick. Bright leaf tobacco. Now, most of you probably don't smoke, and or at least you don't smoke tobacco anyway, say it like that. The thing of them is, is that uh, when we talk about smoking, uh, if you've ever smoked tobacco before, and you've ever smoked a cigar on the one hand or a cigarette on the other, there's a different difference. A good big cigar takes 30 minutes to an hour. I mean, it's just an involved process. But those bright leaf tobacco uh, cigarettes, oh, you can smoke them just like that. You can smoke them quick and fast. As a former smoker, I, for tw 10 years I smoked. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was uh, quick, fast, and in a hurry. Uh, by the way, where all this tobacco was found was in North Carolina. North Carolina. That was the home of bright leaf tobacco. That was the home of all those, uh, the new tobacco. Uh, in fact, actually, if you're familiar with some basketball, they don't quite use this term anymore, but it, it used to be called Tobacco Road, like Duke in North Carolina and so on. In fact, the name of Duke University, put this in your notes, is for the real father of, of big tobacco, to use a, a loaded phrase. It's named for James Buchanan Duke. 
James Buchanan Duke made his uh, fortune initially during the war and came on afterwards. And they would tell you anything that you wanted to say here about how great their tobacco was, Duke tobacco. Uh, they will even use Robert E. Lee. There's some uh, old, I think it was called Old Dixie or something of that nature. You could check the exact name. But there were some tobacco cans that were promoted in the late uh, 19th and especially the early 20th century with Robert E. Lee and the Confederates marching to battle. You need to buy our tobacco. Advertising was always part of the tobacco story, but this new bright leaf tobacco in North Carolina especially is part of this new South, and on we can go. But uh, I think that's a good place to stop because I've pretty much said all I needed to say on the subject. Uh, you know, there, I will say this before I forget this, I will, before I go, is, is that when you talk about this new South, you're also going to see the question of what do you do with the freedmen? What do you do with the former slaves? Uh, obviously, you're going to see by 1900, you're going to see the rise of Jim, so Jim Crow segregation. I'll deal with that more in a later lecture when it comes to progress, excuse me, with populism. I'll deal with it at that time. But you're going to have two real uh, individuals talking about the New South and what does it mean for the former slave and their descendants. Two names that you probably need to look up and know a little bit about. I'll ask a question or two about both of them. One is Booker T. Washington and the other is W.B. Du Bois. It's not Du Bois, it's Du Bois. They take two very different views around the 20th century, the turn of the 20th century, about what does it mean to be a freedman or a descendant of a freedman, and what do they do? Do you ask for political equality now, or do you go for economic uplift, and then the quality comes with it? Those are the two main views. So I'll leave that up to you to read. So, anyways, uh, those are the main points for this uh, New South lecture, and I think that's a good place to stop. So, uh,